Right, well, thank you, Julia. Thank you for the invitation. We've got 24 slides, 30 minutes. Stay with me. <laughs> right, just by way of background, I'm a retired clinical geneticist. Well, you probably got that from the plenary session. I'm co-lead facilitator of the Pediatric Huntington's Disease Juvenile Onset Huntington's Disease Working Group of the EHDN. Uh, we're not quite sure what we should be calling ourselves, but... The <laughs> I've been a local investigator on a number of clinical trials and I'm on the scientific oversight committee for Join HD. So that's me, that's where I'm coming from, though you can work out what, what my biases might be. In terms of the talk, I want to say what is juvenile onset Huntington's disease? I'm going to say something about the number of cases. Throughout the talk, I'm going to talk about terminology and challenges. Um, I've been asked specifically to talk about difficulties with diagnosis. I want to talk about uh, regulation of clinical trials and in particular paediatric investigation plans and I did listen to Seth's talk this morning when he spoke about his interaction with the Food and Drug Administration. I'll mention Join HD and <coughs> hopefully I'll come to a conclusion and we'll have some areas for discussion and some time. Right, starting with history, because that's usually where we go. Generally speaking, if you're going to talk about juvenile onset Huntington's disease, you're going to mention this paper by Hoffman in 1888. He described a family, obviously in Germany, uh, and it's the first clear, succinct description of juvenile onset Huntington's disease. Now, we haven't got a pointer, so you'll have to put up with me, but basically, uh, he described this individual in some detail. She was aged 36. Now that's important. He told us that she was uh, born when her mother already had career. Now we know epilepsy can be a feature of juvenile onset Huntington's disease. There's a story aged two or three she fell down a chimney and had epilepsy. What that, the significance of that is lost in 1888. We can't say anything more. We're told that she learned well at school, but at the end of the school years, she was twitching and restlessness. Now, we don't know when school years ended in Germany in 1888, but we're going to assume it was before the age of 20. And up to the age of 22 or 23, she was able to do handicrafts. There's less detail on her cousin, uh, who had onset at the age of 10 and died uh, during her 20s. Now, <clears throat> they're both adults, and that's important. And can you see, uh, females in diagrams are usually circles and males are squares, that in both those cases the transmitting parent was the mother, which is again unusual, but not categorical. I can hear some ums going, I might come back to that. Right, we're going to move from 1888 to 1968 and talk about George Bruin. George Bruin was a neurologist in Holland and he summarized 150 cases of juvenile onset Huntington's disease. I have read his paper. It's, it's a bit like trying to read a telephone directory uh, uh, going through that. But anyway, if you come to his conclusions, if cases are included with onset or mani uh, manifestation before the age of 20, the prevalence will range between the estimates of 5 and 10%. Now, currently, we use onset before the age of 21. That is, we include 20. The other thing to tell you is, when did this term juvenile Huntington's disease or juvenile onset Huntington's disease come into being? And it's lost in the mists of time. Nobody really knows. Now, the transmitting parent is more... F oh, uh, Bruin noted that the transmitting parent is more frequently the father, which you all know about but it's not absolute. It's about 80% of cases. Have to be a bit careful here because if you've got a father with Huntington's disease, it's not inevitable that his children will have juvenile onset Huntington's disease. But if you turn it the other way around, if you have an individual with juvenile onset Huntington's disease, it is more likely that the transmitting parent is the father. It, you've got to be careful on the way that you say it. Right, well, I'll move on because Right, now I'm going to talk about movement disorder. And basically, we 
put them into two different categories. You either have extra movements, which is the career, or you have slowness of movements. And uh, there are various words for that. Parkinsonism, and I've spelt that deliberately with a small p to distinguish it from Parkinson's disease, but, but it's features of Parkinson's, which is why it's with a small p. Bradykinesia, difficulty initiating movement, slow alternating movements, and you can have abnormal posture, um, which is called dystonia. Now, if you have any patient with Huntington's disease, whether they're juvenile onset or adult onset or whatever, and you examine them, you will see a mixture of movement disorders. So if I have a typical patient with adult onset Huntington's disease with typical career, they will have some slowness of movement. They won't be able to do that as quickly as somebody without. So they will have a mixture of movement disorders. Now in adult onset Huntington's disease, in the early stages of the condition, career is more prominent. And then as the disease progresses, the career tends to plateau and you're seeing the slowness of movement more easily. Now that pattern, again, it's not absolute, um, um, is different in juvenile onset Huntington's disease. It's more likely that you're going to see the slowness of movement as a prominent feature much earlier in the course of the disease. Whatever, however you call it. Now, Bruin uh, commented that the main feature is that poverty of movement occurs earlier in JHD. Now, I've used the term JHD because that's the older term, and we're trying to use the term juvenile onset Huntington's disease, and I'll explain why in a few slides. He talked about slowness of speech. He said they may not have career, and I can remember, because now that I've reached that old trout stage, uh, I can remember phrases like a career career, which doesn't make any sense at all, um, and epilepsy or myoclonus, which is sort of rapid jerking movement, can occur in up to 30% of cases. He didn't say this in his paper, but it's widely accepted that the pathology in the brain is more widespread than in typical adult onset Huntington's disease. So it's a spectrum. It's not a distinct category. And the definition, onset before the age of 21 years, is arbitrary. Now, I'm going to talk about this paper by Moser et al. in uh, 2017. Now, that, some of you may have been involved in that. It was done uh, in North America using social media, and parents were asked about the features that, that were present in their well, I suppose children. <clears throat> um, one of the things they mentioned was ticks. So these are less frequently reported um, features of juvenile Huntington's disease or juvenile onset. Uh, pain. Now that's a difficult one, but people can have quite significant pain. And uh, I've put, is it related to the dystonia? The, so the cause of that pain is a bit unclear, but pain can be more of a feature in juvenile onset Huntington's disease. Itching, especially if you've got a very high CAG repeat count. Um, and disturbed sleep, they mentioned, but that's also common in Huntington's disease. So this, is, this was a survey of parents in North America, and it's worth pointing out that these features are seen less prominently. Now, how many patients have we got? Now, it's always expressed as a percentage of the total Huntington's disease population. And that in itself is a problem. Because we heard this morning that the prevalence of Huntington's disease varies in different countries, and the lifespan of the population in different countries will vary. Um, now, if you look at the papers, you get a range anywhere between 1 and 16%, which I found particularly trying and difficult. Now, there's a statistical method for combining information from papers. I won't go into it because we haven't got time, and quite frankly, I don't know what it is. I ask a statistician. Um, but basically, we did that, 
And if you look at the European population and the North American population, uh, then you get an answer of 4.81% from combining information from all those papers. And you have to put the 95% confidence interval, which means that I'm 95% sure that the true answer is somewhere between 3.31 and 6.58. So about 5% is a reasonable figure. If you're in, northern, in, in Europe, Northern Europe, Western Europe, and North America. Now that's important. Why do we want to know that? It's important if we're thinking about needs and services. And it's also going to be important later on when we're considering clinical trials. Now, I want to point out that JOHD is not one condition. It's broad. So although we've got 5% of cases, and you'd think that, right, OK, we sorted that out. Within that 5%, we've got a very broad category. I could be talking about a young adult aged 30 who started with Huntington's disease aged 19. Now, I spoke to this lady uh, a moment or two ago, and you told me your daughter was diagnosed at 19 and now aged 40. So that's one aspect of juvenile onset Huntington's disease. You could have a young adult diagnosed aged 22, say 22, and then when you take the history, you say, oh yes, the condition started aged 18 or 19. He's still got juvenile onset Huntington's disease. They'll be in adult services. They may have features more similar to adult onset Huntington's disease than the more typical JOHD. It's, <clears throat> it's a spectrum. You could have a young person affected age 15, 16, or 17. They started at a younger age. You could have a child currently un affected under the age of 12. And you could have a child who starts at a very young age. And they're, they're rare, but they do occur. And they're going to be in paediatric services. So in terms of the paediatricians looking after people with JOHD, they're going to be looking at less than 5% of the HD population. So it's important because who's involved with the care? And it may be that they have limited experience. Now we talk about multidisciplinary teams. So if you have a young person with uh, Huntington's disease, an ad hoc multidisciplinary team may need to form around that person. And you may have experiences of that, and it may work well, and it may work not so well. Treatment is symptomatic and supportive. Well, that's true for adult onset. But the needs of a teenager differ, and you've got to transition them for, to adult services. A young adult may or may not have features similar to AOHD, but I said, said that. But the other thing that I've come across, not often, I grant you, but over the years I've seen a few people with juvenile onset Huntington's disease who've had children of their own, which is then um, <clears throat> an additional challenge in terms of managing the family because we talk about the family rather than the individual. So we've got a broad spectrum. Now, if you're going to talk about Huntington's disease at some point in the talk, you're going to get a diagram like this, which tells you that the cause of the condition is a genetic change in the first part of the gene, and it's an expansion of the CAG repeat length. And below 27, <clears throat> that's considered unequivocally normal. Between 27 and 35, that's normal but it can expand further in future generations, so that's the area from which new mutations can arise. Over 40 is unequivocally abnormal, that's okay. And then somewhere or other you'll see, and somebody even mentioned it on the expert panel uh, in, in the plenary session, over 60, juvenile onset, uh, and I've put there 50%. And the reason I've put 50% is that if you take the if you take somebody with over 60 CAG repeats, they will very likely have juvenile onset Huntington's disease. But if you take the spectrum of juvenile onset Huntington's disease, only 50% have, 
have a CAG repeat length greater than 60. So that's why that 50% is there. And then over 80, and I've got here, you've got infantile or childhood onset. This is onset before the age of 10. And this speaks to our language. Because somebody could be have onset at the age of 10 and now be 12, but they're not infants. Um, and again, juvenile onset, somebody uh, who has onset 18, 19, and now an adult, well, calling them juvenile isn't quite right. Juvenile obviously means young. In, I mean, if you look up the Oxford English Dictionary, juvenile means young. So we need to think about our language. Now, that categorization comes from the American College of Medical Genetics and the American Society of Human Genetics. And basically, the other thing that we know is that large increases in the CAG repeat length are more common in sperm, which is something that George Bruin did not know about. He made the observation <coughs> uh, that the transmitting parent was more frequently the father, but it's not an absolute. And, <coughs> well, he didn't know that, but we do now. Now, I've been asked to talk about difficulties in diagnosis. And one of the things that I want to point out is that interpreting a laboratory test result depends on the clinical context. I could be talking about anything in medicine, anything at all, and that would be true. So if you're going to interpret a laboratory test or an x-ray, you need to know the clinical context. Now, in terms of Huntington's disease, we can say that we've got three time points. At point A, the person is clearly asymptomatic. And if you get a CAG repeat length that's abnormal in that individual, then you've done a predictive test. <clears throat> point C, individual is unequivocally affected. You do a laboratory test, you do your CAG repeat length test, and it's abnormal, that's a diagnostic test. And it all depends on the clinical context. And then you've got this point B, where you're uncertain as to whether the patient is clinically affected or clinically unaffected. The other point to make is that the diagnosis is a clinical judgment. It's not based on tests. It's made on clinical judgment. <clears throat> now, one would hope that if you had a bunch of clinicians at point A, they'd all say, unaffected. At point B, they, at point C, they'd say all affected. But around here, there'll be different clinical judgments. One of the things that cropped up in the plenary session was a question. And the question was, if you're in Enroll HD, I mean, it's not juvenile, I'm talking about adults now, uh, you have juvenile onset, uh, sorry, you've got somebody in Enroll and they're showing features that you as a clinician recognise as the start. What do you say? And the answer is, it depends on your clinical judgement. You've got to make an assessment as to where the patient is coming from. And my clinical judgement, obviously I believe to be correct, may be different from somebody else's. So, clinical diagnosis is a clinical judgement. It's not a radiological diagnosis. You have to have an abnormal CAG repeat length, otherwise you you're completely wrong, but <clears throat> it's a judgment. We want to avoid predictive testing in children. I'm going to mention this paper by Cronin because they combined, they did another of those combination studies, they combined information from a number of studies, and the presenting feature was non-motor in the majority of cases, mainly behavioural. And that can have potential conflict with doctors. How have I managed it? Well, I've done neuropsychological assessments, which, <clears throat> well, you're either familiar with them or you're not, but basically, broadly, we can talk about an IQ test, because there, what I'm thinking is, I can do that at, at, at one time point, and I can repeat it in a year or so to see if there's been a decline. <clears throat> Doing an MRI scan is controversial. The reason it's controversial is because if I request an MRI scan, the other doctors in the room will say, hang on a minute, don't you know that uh, the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis, not a radiological diagnosis? Well, yes, I do. But there are some radiological features, so that might be helpful. 
but in the context of a young person, they may need sedation. And so that might feed into it. So that's why I've put MRI controversial, contested, or whatever. Now, Martha Nance did produce a list of diagnostic features for those with onset under the age of 10. So she said you can make a diagnosis in somebody under the age of 10 if you've got a family history, usually the father, plus two or more of declining school performance, seizures, oral, motor, oral, oh dear, oral motor dysfunction, rigidity, or problems with walking. Okay? <clears throat> so that's helpful. So you have a young person under 10 and the parents are concerned and you can say, right, am I in diagnostic territory? And you can go through this checklist and that will help you. But you've got no similar list for the group between 11 and uh, 20, or 21 if you, 11 to 20 inclusive. And as we've said, it's often non-motor, so that's difficult and challenging. Now, Cronin, in their survey, looked at the actual CAG repeat lengths. And I think they had, oh gosh, um, I think they had over 150, but I can't quite remember, and I didn't put it on the slide. Half of them had uh, more than 64, and half had less than 64 CAG repeats, which goes back to a point I made earlier. But look at that range. It's gone from 39, 39 to 265. All right, so even if we're looking at the CAG repeat length, I've said it's a broad category clinically, it's a broad category genetically. Somebody, uh, Lauren was talking, this is juvenile, so it's truncated at 20, age 20. It, you can see that I can say that there's that negative correlation between age of onset and CAG repeat length. I could draw a line through that. But you can see that that would be an average, and there's a considerable spread around the average, which is why the CAG repeat length doesn't tell you about the age of onset for an individual. Works for a group, not an individual. Now, I drew that line, perhaps not very well, but anyway, that's the best I did. So I've separated out those with onset over the age of 10 and under the age of 10. And can you see, under the age of 10, there isn't, well, that correlation is sort of lost a bit, or even a lot. <clears throat> and the other thing I did, I'm not quite sure where 80 is on their axis, but anyway, I, I decided to put it there. <clears throat> now, when I talk about juvenile Huntington's disease, or ju sorry, I'm getting it wrong, aren't I? Juvenile onset Huntington's disease, um, I'm talking about this whole group. But what I find, not infrequently, is the person to whom I'm speaking is actually focused on this group. Or perhaps this group. Um, whereas here, somebody could have onset at 19 and now be age 40. But, but, but I'm thinking that they're all juvenile onset Huntington's disease. So we've got a problem with our language. The other thing is that we spoke about genetic modifiers in the plenary session. And so there's at least a two-stage mechanism for the development of symptoms. And it, you, that might come up in the conference. Now, I, I hesitated over this, but I've decided to just be up front and talk about um, uh, disease progression and survival rates. And it's usually said that juvenile onset Huntington's disease have a shorter disease um, duration and uh, a faster disease progression. Well, sort of. Now, I'm grateful for Nando Squirtieri. I know Nando's not in the room, but he may go through this in his talk. Uh, this is survival, this is a survival curve for those with adult onset, Huntington's disease. Now I think he had a separation of around 80, well I think he was around 78 or whatever, but we'll call it 80. If you had less than 80 CAG repeats and juvenile onset, it wasn't that different from the adults. 
But if you had a CAG repeat length over 80, then yes, you can see that, that, that problem. So we've got to think about it not as one homogeneous condition. Now, juvenile Huntington's disease patients are often excluded from clinical trials. So in preparation for this talk, I went through clinical, a, web, a website, clinicaltrials.gov, and I searched for Huntington's disease recruiting phase two or three, and I got a list of studies. There were about 14 on the list, but I didn't put them all on the slide because it would clutter it up and, uh, you know, the point's the point. Basically, you can look to see who's included. 18 years or older, 25 to 65, no features of juvenile onset Huntington's disease. So this one, 25 to 50, you get the point. Uh, onset 18 years or older, exclude JOHD. Either implicitly or explicitly, juvenile onset Huntington's disease is excluded from clinical trials. Now, we heard about the Food and Drug Administration, and they've got a class waiver. What's a class waiver? Well, it means that if you're doing a study for Huntington's disease and you want market authorization, you do not have to test it in children. Now, <clears throat> sorry, the, 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 there was a video from four ladies uh, who went and spoke to the HDA uh, a few weeks ago and they made a presentation of what they were going to say to the HDA. I don't know if they're in the room. I'll be quite happy to speak to them afterwards. But basically, Huntington's disease is on the list for a class waiver. Now, why is that? Because the necessary studies are impossible or highly impractical because, for example, the number of patients is so small or the patients are geographically dispersed. Now, if that's your criterion, then putting Huntington's disease on the list is reasonable. It may have difficulties and I hadn't appreciated it until I, spoke, until I heard their video presentations, it may have uh, implications for access to treatments if one of the clinical trials is successful. Now, the European Medicines Agency also had a class waiver, but round about 2012, they removed it. And do you know what they did? They didn't discuss it with me. How could that be? They just did it. And so I got an email out of the blue two or three years later saying, what do I think about this class waiver? Well, I didn't know what a class waiver was, so, so there we are. So we had to find out. Now, the European Medicines Agency is set up, oh, the FDA is set up by statute, by an act of, I don't know whether it's an act of Congress or a bill of Congress, but it's set up by a statute. The EMA is set up by a statute, the European Union Directive number five, six, seven, eight, whatever. And in that statute, you can have a class waiver uh, if the medicine, medicinal product is ineffective or unsafe in part or all of the pediatric population. The disease only occurs in the adult population. Well, we said that's not the case. Does not represent a, thera a significant therapeutic benefit over existing treatments for pediatric patients. Well, if those are your criteria, you'd say, well, you can't have a class waiver for pediatric, for, for um, juvenile onset Huntington's disease. And what they said, oh sorry, I'll go through this slide. So <clears throat> as far as we can, can work out from the UK's regulatory authority, they're following the EMA for now. Uh, they've got different frameworks and different decisions, but the EMA, I phoned them up and said, what, you know, what do you think you're doing? I didn't quite say that. Um, uh, but basically, they said, we're going to force you, and they, the guy did use the word force, force you to think about children. That's possibly a good thing. How do we respond? Well, we've got a problem with our definition. We're going to talk about joint HD in a minute and the natural history study. So we, that is our working group, published this diagram so that it's there in the literature for future reference. So the total number of cases of Huntington's disease is represented by this box, around 6%. Right, you cannot do it. I've got two slides. Randomized controlled trial under 18. The, you can't do it. The EMA is demanding a PIP, a specific waiver or a deferral. We, 
in terms of our working group, have indicated to the EMA, and it's difficult because it'll differ from study to study, and they've got to make an individual case, but studying about 20 to 30 patients might be reasonable. They don't have to all be in Europe. They can be in North America. The EMA is not, not that fussed. But what if there's more than one product at the same time? Could we find 30 paediatric patients for company A and another 30 for company B? That's a challenge. So join HD, <coughs> and you may hear more about that later in the conference, has multiple motives. But one of them is how many paediatric cases can we find? We need to have natural history studies specifically for this group because if we're going to engage with the EMA and the pharmaceutical industry, the regulators, the more we've organized for ourselves, the better. And if you can say that's the natural history, then you introduce the new drug, you, 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 you've already started to get your control group organized. And I think we have to agree as to how to subclassify groups. So take home messages, JOHD is a broad category, spectrum of features, differ from but overlap with adult onset Huntington's disease. I'm proposing that we debate the subdivision and the language. JOHD is currently excluded from clinical trials, but the EMA is demanding that we do something, and we do have an opportunity to influence pharma and regulators, and uh, I commend JOHD to you. Many thanks. <laughs>